Council meeting to order. I'll ask uh, for a motion to accept the agenda as printed. Jim and Yolanda. All in favor? Uh, declaration of pecuniary interest, if any. None noted. Uh, approval of previous minutes of uh, the Planning Advisory Committee meeting held August 4th, 2015. Brock and Yolanda. All in favor? Carried. Uh, minutes of the Planning of of the second Planning Advisory Committee meeting held August 4th, 2015. This one, the Blythe Legion, Jim, and Trevor, all in favor? Carried. Uh, minutes of the regular council meeting held August 4th. Rob and Trevor, all in favor? Carried. Uh, no deputations, petitions, or uh, schedule. Uh, Reeves report. It was a very busy AMO convention, as everybody knows. It was the provincial government do not realize that there is a difference between rural and urban. Uh, I felt that tonight strong. Sharon and Jim uh, might have uh, their own comments. Um, it's something that we're definitely going to have to work with. Um, and I feel that we will have to put some meetings together uh, for the Good Roads Roma Convention in February where we will visit various ministers in the halls and a few other places that I did have the opportunity to uh, talk with a number of the ministers so that uh, it was known we were there, and as always, I had Huron County uh, clothing on so they knew where I came from, and I made that abundantly clear. Um, moving to the County Council report. Um, there is a number of things coming up, uh, and that I think Sharon or Connie could give a better report on uh, county economic development, train the trainer sessions, uh, whether it's right now or later. Do you want to? I actually do have that in my report yeah. coming up later on in okay, the Okay, that, that'll be good. Uh, moving on to 6.3, finance and treasury, bills and accounts. Um, you can ask questions. Sharon will try and answer. Without Donna here, um, she will get back to you if there's questions that Sharon can't answer. No questions. Bill? Uh, page three, Blue Rhino Designing, uh, Alice Monroe, I don't understand what that was, 13,400. Mm -hmm. Sure, that would have been one of the reports that was done through the Alice Monroe Labor, Partner, Labor Market Partnership Agreement. So Blue Rhino did the, um, the museum study, actually. Okay, so that's that's all part and parcel of the other. Okay. Yes. Um, I have a question. Has somebody invented uh, uh, you know, something that we haven't heard of? Are you going to live forever? We seem to have a, a bunch of cancellations or resales of cemetery plots. I've never seen that before. Mm -hmm. What? Kathy, can you go on The 
one, the people have changed their mind and they decided to buy an each in the columbarium. Oh, okay. And so we purchased that plots for the full interment and resold them at each in the columbarium. And the other one was just to um, correct a sale of a plot that uh, was just, um, that happened a few years ago. So. so we didn't find a fountain of youth after all? No, let me know, Bill. Okay. <laughs> I move that the uh, bills and accounts be approved as listed. Uh, Trevor, I would second. I just, I'll second, but I do have a question. Go ahead. Um, page 11, multiple enterprises that says driveway and pad pavement, 25,000. Is that Shooter Street? That Shooter Street? No further questions. All in favor? <coughs> Here. Uh, we have Pat uh, here. Uh, who is going to share? Is he going to uh, yes. answer questions on record facilities? I can. Uh, okay. We're moving into 6.4.1. Town Hall Theater and application for trillion funding. Uh, questions? Uh, do we need to do a motion on that? Uh, Trevor? I'll move the motion that's printed on. And Yolanda's seconding. Okay. Uh, it's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, everybody all in favor? Carried? Okay, moving to 6.4.2, Public Works, and it's the OCIF expression of interest for Patrick Street. I would move that we approve this authorization for staff to submit an expression of interest. Okay. And James Seckman. All in favor? Carry. Okay, uh, 6.4.3, uh, the utility department update. Uh, is there any questions on it? And uh, if not, the uh, motion to receive for information purposes. Bill and Ray. All in favor? Gary. Uh, moving to 6.4.4, the fire department of North here and the department update. Is there any questions for David on that? Anything extra you would like to add, David? Um, I'd uh, send out to Sharon. Uh, um, like to briefly talk about uh, uh, Oriental and Chinese lanterns, which has been on uh, our sort of fire prevention target. And if you want to do that now, Sharon, or later on, that, that's fine. Um, yes. Do you, we do have a motion to accept the report. If you want to, um, just just a couple of a couple of quick on, quick notes on the report. To ask council to flag the 28th of September, which will be our annual disaster. Uh, day uh, as required by Emergency Management Ontario and that will be done in cooperation with uh, Suncor and Foxton's uh, this year. Um, you'll also notice that uh, uh, we continue to work on some of our best practices and it seems whenever we implement our best or introduce our best practices shortly after that we get to implement them. Um, we now have two female personnel uh, who are attending incidents and we're having health and safety issues with regards to washroom facilities for all of our personnel at long duration incidents. Uh, we have made an arrangement with a portable toilet company for emergency delivery of a portable toilet to our workplace, which in our case is a, a long duration fire ground. Uh, a week after we uh, made that uh, agreement, uh, or had that discussion with them, we had our first incident where they uh, needed to deliver a toilet, which 
Uh, it's one of those things you take for granted, but at, at the same time, this, the days of using your socks are uh, are, are done. Um, secondly, we've been working for quite some time on uh, underfloor manure uh, related issues with regards to fire. And uh, we had an inc uh, incident uh, uh, in the ACW and we used all of our, our sort of uh, latest and greatest uh, best practices. And uh, everything we've been working on, everything we've been doing, uh, all proved themselves to work right and work well. So, uh, you know, a lot of those lessons and a lot of things we're doing are, are things we've, we've experienced and built, uh, built around the lessons learned. Uh, but what we're doing is working and uh, we're now getting requests from across the province and even out of the United States uh, with some interest in what we do with uh, manure uh, in, uh, in pig barns on fire, so so I think we're on the right path. And uh, one other uh, uh, quick note: uh, we received our first check uh, from Firemark, which is the insurance uh, uh, company that looks after uh, helping us process insurance claims on structure fires. Uh, so that was uh, that was kind of nice to get the uh, the first uh, check through that. Mm -hmm. Okay, for the motion to accept uh, Trevor and Ryan. All in favor? Carry. Okay. So, if, if I could just for a, a few moments, pardon me, but I did bring my garbage with me. Um, there's been talk, uh, I may have heard James Marshall on the, the radio. Uh, uh, one of the things that's becoming more common and it's actually becoming a little bit of a concern for us are oriental lanterns, uh, sky lanterns, uh, Chinese lanterns, depends what you, you choose, to, uh, uh, choose to call them. And uh, fire services are starting to take a, a much more active stance in terms of how we uh, how we deal with those because what's happening is, is we're starting to get fires and fire issues uh, around uh, something that's supposed to be just aesthetic and, uh, and pretty and I wanted to bring a couple things to council's attention and then uh, have a discussion at the, the conclusion of that um, just as a perspective when we're talking about oriental lanterns uh, these are the five that picked up off the streets of Hawaii uh, one weekend, uh, first weekend in August, it's actually the civic holiday weekend. And I'll be honest, I'd never seen these things before, other than on, on videos or in fire stuff. But one of the concerns is, is that when these lanterns get caught in trees or get damaged, the principle of them having a flame in here that creates heat works fine as long as the bag is intact. But if something damages the bag, or if a gust of wind collapses the bag, lanterns that are on fire actually will uh, collapse to the ground and set things on fire. So in, in one night, I managed to pick up five of these uh, through a fly. Uh, some of you are aware I walk every night, it's just sort of one of those things I do. Uh, but in one night, in my path, which is a 30 minute walk around life, I came across five. And as a, as a fire chief, that's a little concerning. And uh, I wanted to, uh, wanted to discuss uh, one of a, a, just sort of a, a quick discussion about what, uh, about what this looks like. So, So these are called uh, Chinese lanterns, Oriental lanterns, sky lanterns, um, and they are pretty. Uh, I'll be the first one when I saw these going across the I thought they were pretty cool. But one of the issues uh, that's coming up is uh, here's a, a field that was set on fire uh, by a lantern and went down and, and lit the field up. Uh, this is another example where a family was uh, forced to leave their home after Chinese lanterns set fire to their roof on their house. Uh, this is a factory in Michigan whose uh, roof was set on fire by Chinese lanterns. Uh, this is one in uh, England and what makes this uh, different uh, aside from the fact that it was uh, six million pounds or twelve million dollars in damage 
the Chinese lantern coming into the factory on fire and uh, the subsequent fire that came from it was all caught on closed circuit TV. Uh, so if you look at the red circle at the top there, when you play the video, you actually see the lantern crashing down into a recycling pile. And uh, the entire event was captured on the closed circuit TV. So then let's have a look at Blythe. And what you can't see real well in this picture, but in this picture uh, uh, are two, four, six, uh, seven lanterns uh, flying across Blythe. Uh, this was taken uh, from some of you who might be familiar a little bit with Blythe. Uh, the building for light on there is United Church. Uh, so it's out for my nightly walk, and uh, in total there were about 30 some odd of these lanterns that went across Blythe that night. Uh, five of them uh, landed in town. One of the challenges we face is that our burn bylaw, Blue Waters burn bylaw, prohibit Chinese lanterns because they're safety risks. Our neighbors' bylaws, however, do not prohibit the sale or uh, prohibit the, the use of these. So we can have lanterns being lit in central Huron and blowing across north Huron, some landing in our town, some landing in fields in, in Morris Turnberry. But as a fire chief, there's nothing I can do because it's perfectly legal for people to light those. My concern is, is twofold. Uh, firstly, like I say, you can see where the, the bags burn through. Got another one. The fact these came down in Blythe, there were only a few hundred feet of flight before they came down. Bags torn, this one comes down while it's still burning because the bag is torn. Well, if those land on the right thing, they will set it on fire, just as we saw in the pictures. The other thing is, is that when these things get hung up in trees, get hung up in hydro poles, uh, our business people, our residents, our, our North Huron staff work hard to make a community that looks clean and tidy and presentable. If you get a whole bunch of this stuff sort of stuck in the up out of reaching trees and so forth, uh, on a personal level, it does kind of negate some of the, uh, the efforts of all of our, our people to make our community clean and presentable. So as I said, our burn bylaw says you can't use these, but the reality for me is, and our ratepayers need to understand, is that if you buy them in Blythe and decide to have them in Blythe and want to go to the edge of Blythe and such a hurt and light them, I can do absolutely nothing about it. Uh, in my books, this is littering. Uh, because you're basically putting garbage in someone else's property. Like the, this is a lot of stuff. If I threw this out of my car onto someone's property in Blythe, the police officer was behind me, he'd probably be, probably be pulling me over and have a chat. Uh, just because they're flying through the air, in my mind, doesn't make them any different. Uh, but I want people to be aware that there is a safety risk. Uh, the sheet you have there is put out by the National uh, Fire Protection Association. And, and it's pretty clear cut that these are a bad idea. Uh, but I also want the ratepayers to understand that if they do see these or they're landing on their property, but they weren't lit in North Huron, understand that our power to do much about that is, is very limited. Uh, so all we can really do is, is that as James Marshall is on the radio, which is, uh, is talking about the risks, uh, uh, risks posed by these and hope people choose uh, uh, choosing what in my books would be the, the common sense uh, <coughs> common sense answer. Um, any questions on, on these lanterns? Trevor. So David, my guessing is we can't confirm or deny whether those five lanterns that were lit, those ones there, were lit in Blythe or lit in oh, no, I, Timbuktu. I, I, when there were 35 of them, I made my walk, my walk a little bit longer. And they were, uh, they all came from Central Huron into Blythe. So, so, so what you're saying is that we still, we don't have any, I it's got not, it's I not do. really our, I guess where, I, where I'm coming is not really our rate payers that need to be provided the, um, provided the little social talk and says oh. that this is not good, but we don't have much to do with what we can do in other municipalities. Well, what our rate payers need to understand is that you can't do this in North Huron. So yes. that's the first thing you under, need to understand. Uh, secondly, uh, our ratepayers need to understand the reason why, which is they are they are a uh, fire danger. And uh, the, the third thing you need to understand is, is that while we say you can't in North Huron, uh, you can all around us. So, uh, so so I think those are the three messages for our, our ratepayers. And uh, we're going to do our part to try and get this out because some of the local media uh, obviously extends beyond North Huron's boundaries in terms of awareness. Um, but to me, this is a safety risk. Uh, that civic holiday weekend that we got rain on the Sunday was very dry. There were a lot of fields if this one had gone down. 
on firing some of the fields, we would have lit up the field. Um, you know, and if they if they go into someone's house with the uh, with cedar shaped roofs or otherwise, uh, there'll be issues as well. Um, but those are the those are the three key points. Okay, James, can these be bought and buy? Yep. Can we can we go and say these can't be sold in Hawaii? I'm just yeah. Well, and, and see, we're we're running the same I, I thing, and and see, and James and I have talked about that. We have fireworks restrictions in terms of sale dates for fireworks, but you drive to the edge of Wayne the Morris Turnberry, and there are no restrictions. You drive to the edge of Blythe and go into Central Huron, and there are no restrictions. So one of the laments of the merchants within our own municipality is is that people are going to go buy the fireworks, and they might well be taking them to their cottage along the lake or else, but I can't sell them to the people because I'm in North Huron, but if I was located on the edge of North Huron, I'm free to sell them even if they're not going to set them off within our own municipality. Um, we're going to be talking about this with the fire chiefs and see what kind of traction we get, but uh, we I've heard from more than uh, more than one person that says, well, you know, I'm just going to go up to the edge of Wayne and buy my fireworks and going up to Point uh, Point Clark for the weekend. Can't buy them in Wingham, but I'll go out to uh, the gas bar and buy them there. And, yeah. So it, it, it's a little bit difficult. This is where if, if we've had a county-wide agreement on some of the stuff, it makes it, it makes it far easier, but that, that isn't the case. Okay. And the, the only other thing I wanted to throw up is uh, uh, I'm getting lots of people asking how are we doing this year compared to last year. So I just thought in a 20 second graph, uh, the dark blue on the left is uh, this year's call volume as of the 31st of July. Uh, dark blue bar on the right was our budget of call volume for the 31st of July. So you'll see we're still uh, running a, a little bit ahead of schedule. But if you look at the 2014 bar, we're nowhere near, uh, nowhere near where uh, we were last year. And we're, we're I think our families, employers, and maybe our community too are thankful for that. But if uh, anybody wants one of these, feel free to. Uh, <laughs> I've been sitting in my garage since August 1st, so Andy's been asking, when are you getting rid of those? Uh, after tonight, then go somewhere. But, uh, Can you show us how to like them? Well, <laughs> they're actually here. Yeah, they're pretty straightforward. There's a little handle in there, it creates hot air. Then the hot air just fills the bag, and then the bag just flies away. But when you tear the bag, the hot air doesn't work. Or if it gets caught you in the tree. Even do you don't want it, Brock? <laughs> no. I'm not taking these back once you take them. David, how far will those fly? Uh, over a mile. Uh, this You've one got something that's going to fly over a mile. It's yeah. probably just as dangerous as fireworks. And you've got to be licensed more dangerous. for fireworks. Well, more dangerous some days. A whole lot more dangerous. And you've got, and, and you don't have to have a license to... Um, no. Or a brain in your hand to fire. To <laughs> well, there, there is no requirement, no licensing um, on these. Uh, North Huron and Blue Water do restrict their use because our bylaw is the same as theirs. Uh, some other municipalities are looking at it, but right now, uh, uh, right now our neighbors around us uh, are not. Thank you, David. Uh, moving forward, uh, Public Works Department, 6.423. Still up. Yeah. Still a bit. Yeah. Behind. Uh, uh, 8.1, fly DIA, bicycle safety. BIA right at the deadline for the council, so we're requesting a motion to refer that to the director of public works to report back to council. I'll make that motion. Okay. Second. Uh, second. All in favor? Carried. <coughs> and um, moving to council information.
and it's just the newest release on the community infrastructure funding. Trevor. Move the correspondence be ordered, read, and filed. Seconder. Bill. All in favor? Carried. And there's correspondence available at the clerk's office. Is there any of those points? Trevor. Move the correspondence be ordered, read, and filed. Uh, James second. All in favor? Here. Um, moving into the committee reports, the supply PIA. It's Planetary, Street Fest, <coughs> Perry County uh, Wide Strategic Planning, Train the Trainer, and Sherry is going to do that in the, her report. Um, there is a pile of minutes for the East Wallenage 150th. Someone could pass on to uh, to that committee that uh, they are quite welcome to use our collection. We have a lot of information about East Wallenosh families and history, and uh, if they're interested, they have to do the research themselves. We we don't have the time to dig this stuff out, but but we have a lot of uh, a lot of information. The information is available. Yes, yeah. free of charge. We don't charge. We'll let Ray do that. <laughs> He's the fundraiser, so he can look after the money. Okay. Uh, 12.1. Bylaw number 23, 2015. Being a bylaw to authorize a franchise agreement between the Corporation of the Township of North Huron and Union Gas Limited. This is the first and second reading. Uh, that, or the first and second reading was done April 7th, and this would be the third and final reading to have it engrossed in the bylaw book. So moved. Trevor and Bill, all in favor? Carried. Okay, bylaw number 64, 2015. Is the bylaw? Okay, being a bylaw to amend the zoning on part lot 42, the concessions have the reference plan 22R 6243, 84735 London Road, East Wallenosh, Ward, Township of North Huron, owners Chad and Robin McMichael. Um, and the, Introduced, read a first and second time. Uh, James and Ray. All in favor? <coughs> Very. And uh, uh, the same bylaw uh, be read a third and final time, signed by the leaving clerk and engrossed in the bylaw book. Mm -hmm. uh, Brock and Trevor. All in favor? Okay. Council reports and inquiries. Brock? Uh, I've had a <coughs> complaint by a resident uh, last week. <coughs> I remember him giving me the same uh, story quite some time ago. It has to do with, uh, with cats. This, this gentleman has a very attractive home, lovely lawn, well manicured lawn. And you can't use it because there are as many as a dozen cats using it for their public toilet. Um, it, it's a it's a very very difficult situation. He uh, he's had his uh, lawn furniture destroyed and unusable, and it's on a corner lot, so he gets cats from everywhere. 
Uh, these are not all strays. They're, some of them are uh, of known origin in the neighborhood. Um, we've always fallen back on the old adage that uh, cats are different. They're not like dogs. Cats can't be controlled by bylaws or animal control people. There are too many of them, and none of our neighbors have a solution either. So I'd like, I would like us to at least consider another alternative. And uh, I, I would request that, that we uh, ask uh, staff to come up with a report on uh, what might be done. And I'm thinking in terms of a, of a one-year blitz where we decide to educate the people who own cats and it, maybe educate the cats themselves. But uh, some of the factors that we could consider including in the uh, solution is a, a one-year intensive project to get the cats under control and to educate cat owners in looking after their cats and keeping them confined when, when they're outside. Consider a licensing si system similar to uh, dogs. I don't know if that's feasible or not, but it should be considered. I think that all cats that are on the lease should be impounded. And uh, impounded cats not claimed after the time limit will be put down a substantial fine for claiming these pets. Um, so I, I would make a motion that we request staff to consider putting a, a report together to deal with this issue with a goal of uh, solving the cat problem for our um, people in our communities. I have a motion proposed. Do I have a second? No second motion. James? Discussion. Bill? Uh, I am a cat owner, but and I really wouldn't have an issue letting my cats stay inside. But frankly, uh, we've had a lot of feral cats because I live along the trail at the back of the pond. They come and go year by year. We have a severe winter, we have fewer of them. But you're never going to control. There are too many. This is a rural area. We have barn cats everywhere. <coughs> I know that, uh, for instance, I believe Joe, you've captured quite a few and taken them out of, out of town. Uh, whether or not they've been turning, but. <laughs> they probably beat you home. <laughs> probably. So, I, 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 as much as I agree it's a problem, I, I don't think we can ever reach a solution. Uh, I just don't see it happening and, and uh, putting a campaign to try and catch them all and hire them somebody, I, I think it should be a waste of money. But uh, an educational, just asking people to you know, try and keep their cats indoors. Certainly, you can always do a flyer in the, in the mail. That might be something to try and make them a little more aware of it. I do question whether the excrement problem on his lawn is related to cats, simply because cats tend to bury their excrement. And they don't do it in the middle of the lawn. So I'm very surprised. He perhaps has a raccoon or even a rat problem. Now I found probably what is either rat or raccoon or excrement on my deck a couple nights ago. And, and so, you know, that may be the issue. It might not even be the cats. And I hate to think of the the cats are more rats perhaps. <coughs> These are cats, definitely, and they've been seen. And uh, I just mentioned that uh, I can provide staff with, uh, if they want to speak to this gentleman about his problem, I'll give them his name. Okay. Further discussion, right? I, I suppose maybe it's the same property owner, maybe and maybe not, but I had a uh, complaint too, so I think it's the name too. It's really not fair. <laughs> Trevor? So as I I have the similar concern in and I think the whole municipality has a similar concern. The concern is though how much money do you throw at a problem that you don't know if there's a viable solution? And um, I'm, I'm in support of the, the, uh, the staff. Maybe they have a better idea of what that solution is. I don't know, but I think throwing it, <clears throat> having somebody um, tax or tax, tag their, their pet. Um, isn't necessarily the solution that you're going to gain. You're, you're, 
you're going to get a lot more revenue if people decide to do it. That's if they decide to do it. Um, and we don't have, unless somebody's going to, that, that control is only based on if somebody complains that they haven't got a tag. So I don't know if that's the solution. Um, but the fact of the matter is, if, 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 if rate payers know where these particular cats are coming from, and I know, understand some of them, he does not. Or she does not. I think they have to be. I think they have to decide on how respectful do they want to be with regards to having the conversation with that rate payer. Like, if 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 I'm if I'm a rate payer and and I'm having this problem and I know it's my neighbor's cat, I'm gonna go have a talk with my neighbor at least to see if that's a way that we can solve the problem without causing a whole bunch of other problems. Um, and if that's not possible, then obviously we need to figure out other ways. But I think we need to be gentlemen about it or ladies about it and solve your problem with what you have can control and what you can't control, then we need to figure it out. But to, to blanket the entire municipality with the same blanket, I don't know is the right call because I don't think we're having the same issue in 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 the wheel ward as maybe this particular individual is. So I, I, I don't know that, but my I just don't think blanketing a statement is as that is the right call. And I, for any for a solution it may never change. Jim? This is this isn't the first time this has come to council. It has come before previous councils. And now that I know that Joe was dropping those cats off in my place. But it, it does become a big issue because we do get a lot of cats dropped off. Of, of the community. And, uh, and, and it's a big issue for us too because I have a Jack Russell dog and he just has a wheel. That's not the answer either. <laughs> But I think it, it's, maybe, it's maybe something we should indeed look at, look at the staff, look at That I know that I have visited a number of properties and that it was the flower beds that they were having trouble yes. with yes, that uh, primarily. And that uh, I know that it's another municipality, but there are some products that you can use in flower beds to keep them away, but it's uh, the person that's having the trouble that's paying the bill there. Trevor? The, the only other comment I would have is that I want to understand what what priority level we give this. Because our staff are have enough that we've given them to, to make sure that we need to see reports that are of a higher priority um, when it comes to managing this municipality than it is with regards to cats. So I'm fine with the report, but it's it's number 25 on the list of 25. Not in this taxpayer's uh, estimation. But. Well, okay. sure. Um, we probably received the same complaint uh, from the same rate payer. And I know Kathy did tell me that she had presented a previous report to council on this matter. Um, I think you will see that many rural municipalities do not control cats uh, because there is a significant cost that comes with controlling um, stray cats. As you know from the process of dog control, if we pick up an animal, we have to impound it for a number of days waiting for the owner to claim that. In the case of stray cats, uh, if there are a significant number that we have uh, an animal control officer picking up and taking to the vet, and you think about multiple cats at the vet paying that fee for three days until they can be destroyed and then the cost of destroying the cats, that could come at a significant cost to the ratepayer, and I do believe that's why a lot of rural municipalities do not attempt to control mm -hmm. cats because uh, you've heard We've heard the analogy, it's like herding cats. It's like herding cats. It's quite a, it's quite an undertaking. 
All those in favor of the motion? Uh, Yolanda, Yolanda which is your hand up or not? <laughs> okay. Um, I'll do those opposed. Um, okay. That carries. Uh, the, there will be a staff report then. Could I request a timeline from council on when you'd like that report back? Toward the end of the term. <laughs> <laughs> More specifically. Before the end of the term. Well, there's a date for that. Um, December 31st, December 18th, 20th. As, as, as time available, but don't leave a roads project unsupervised to do it. I'm wondering, can we complete our service review reports first? Sure. So, yeah, that's what, yeah. we've given them an off. We've given them a, a direction on what service reports we would like to see. After that, I'm up for that. But I, I don't think it goes to priority one. <coughs> I agree. Okay. I've had a problem for a lot of time, years. Other council questions or uh, Beaver. <laughs> I've got a property owner that's uh, I have a lot of backed up and, and it's killing quite a number of trees. So what's the procedure there? I have I have somebody that is for people control, yeah. Okay, so oh, well as long as I know where where the problem lies. Right. If you can let me know where the problem yeah, is. Yeah, I certainly can go. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So I I will um I was going to comment that uh, I have had some discussion with Kelly uh, over the last week or so. There has been some questions or concerns about giant hogweed in the Miss Valley, um, and I I just wanted to reiterate to I guess for council that there has been some complaints or some concerns that there that it is in the municipality. Um, and Kelly reassures me that we have a policy in place that they are requested to contact the, uh, the municipality and, and he will send out, him and Tim will go out and investigate the plant to make sure it is of what they say it is and if it's not, then great. If it is, then there is going to be process that has to be dealt with in order to um, remove that. I did ask Kelly and he is going to follow up with me um, and maybe you can make a uh, bring up to council to uh, who is on if it's on a ratepayer's um, property and they have it is it at the ratepayer's cost to remove it or is it at the municipality's cost to remove it because of the invasiveness of this of that um, Kelly didn't know off the top I I'm not I'm not either way if it's a hundred dollars to remove it I don't care if it's ten thousand dollars. I I care, but it's kind of one of those things where I think it's it's got a heightened <coughs> of what that plant can do. So um, because we do have kids around in swampy areas and stuff, I just I think rate payers need to be aware that we have had one one instance, Kelly, that we do have giant hogweed in the municipality. Yeah. So it, it's out there. I, it's not that we don't. So I want to, I think people in the public need to be aware that we do have that and, and make the necessary calls to the, the staff to make sure that they get it dealt with properly. Okay. Now, I know that there is uh, MAFRA specialists that can help with the proper information <coughs> and how to handle it. Uh, but yes, when it's on the noxious weed list and it is as dangerous as it is, uh, that it has to be handled. And uh, maybe even uh, if you think that there's a spread of it or anything, 
how we possibly maybe should be doing even um, some type of media coverage as to be aware of what it is. <coughs> okay, thanks for that, Trevor. Great. And is it is at the county level, are they doing anything about it or what? Uh, Mike Alcock is uh, the uh, front person for the Noxious Weed Act uh, at the county so that uh, he would uh, be another resource person. Uh, anything else? James? I was at the annual conference down in Niagara Falls. And to me, it was a very good conference. They have a lot of good sessions. And, uh, a lot of sessions that we just don't have time to to go to all the sessions that you really want to go to, and it does make your time go. It's a busy, busy three days. No matter how you go. So <coughs> I thank you for the opportunity to be able to go. Thanks, Jim. Uh, um, is that everything for queries and questions, comments? Okay. Uh, moving to 14, the CAO's report. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to check to make sure that all council actually had this report. I noticed it's missing from my package. So if any of you didn't get a chance to see it, then you can definitely provide copies to <coughs> me before you go. I'm not sure if it went out electronically or not. Um, this, this is the county-wide strategic yes. planning project. Yes. So it's providing just a, a brief update for information purposes for council. Um, Connie and I, and members of the public, actually did attend the launch meeting on August 10th. And um, the next meeting will be held on August 26th. Uh, so that is next Wednesday. I do have uh, a recommendation coming in closed session in accordance with our committee appointment policy. Um, for council to review applications to sit on the core team. So we need to appoint five members to a core team who will facilitate the economic development strategic planning uh, process. And at a later date, we will have to appoint an economic development strategic planning committee. And we want that to consist of key stakeholders in the community so that we're representing all of our interests as we develop our economic development strategic plan. Um, so I will just keep council advised uh, of the process as we move forward. And I expect to be coming back on September 8th with some recommendations as to who will sit on the strategic planning committee. But at this time, uh, the rest of the report is just for information purposes. Okay. Uh, we have a motion uh, receiving that for information. James and Yolanda. All in favor? Uh, public gallery questions on uh, what we've been talking about tonight in the agenda. <coughs> Any? I noticed that the August 13th meeting minutes weren't in the package. Was there a reason for that? Uh, we didn't have one. Ooh. We had uh, one on the 4th. August 4th, and because the joint council meeting. The joint council meeting with my That would have been. I thought we passed them on the fourth. Yeah, if that session was in July. It was the 20, 28th of July that that meeting was, was it not? The joint one? Okay, my apologies. My calendar must be wrong. Other questions? Uh, we have an in-camera session.
dealing with personnel matters of an identifiable individual, including a municipal or local board employee, uh, and advice for the subject of solicitor client privilege, including communications necess necessary for the purpose of development, surfacing agreement negotiations. And I have a motion to the camera. Ray and Bob. All in favor? Gary? 